the history behind Creation Club, which is one of the videos that we're going to chat with you about today. Um, I was uh, I've just always been a, a science buff, just super fascinated in science and how it confirms our faith. Um, and I uh, also taught at a uh, high school, uh, at a public high school. And hey, I'm not seeing my projector on screen yet. I'm not reading the nature source. teacher for, for about 14 years, um, avid reader and subscriber of uh, Answers Magazine, which was put out by Angels and Genesis, Ken Ham and all of them. And there was an article, just a very small article in there one year, um, that was really more for teenagers, but it was like, hey, why don't you start a creation club at your high school? And I was like, that's brilliant. And, and, uh, and so that summer, you know, I approached administration with the idea, fully expecting to be uh, told, no, sorry, we can't do that. And, I got a green light, so um, I started hosting a, a half an hour club that met during the school day every uh, two weeks where we talked about the biblical account of creation and the scientific evidence that supports it, and that was openly refuting of evolutionary ideals, and, and I was just putting together slideshows to, you know, to share with 20 or 40 teenagers that, um, that would show up, and and being overzealous, I often tried to cram in way too much for like 37 minutes of class time. But um, after after accumulating a few of these, um, my wife had the brilliant idea of like, why don't you put them on YouTube? It's like, not a bad idea. And so, so you know, I've done that, um, and uh, and then was invited and humbled by uh, being invited by John Pounders to kind of partner with Now TV for uh, for a year where. Um, a lot of those videos were on their channel. Um, I've been on their show a number of times, so uh, it's it's all still just super surreal for me because I'm just a guy from Kansas with a MacBook uh, who loves the Bible, and so I'm I'm super excited to get to share this uh, with you guys. Um, and as soon as you know, the only thing reliable about technology is that it's unreliable. So as soon as we get it to cooperate with us, uh, we'll go through this. But um, but please know uh, right off the bat, my goodness, I am, I am no authority. Uh, I'm just a guy who loves the Bible and, and has read a lot and gets excited about getting to share it with it. Um, and so I'm, I'm just beyond uh, blessed to get to be here with my family, essentially on a working vacation, um, getting to talk, uh, talk to you all about the Bible. So I will, again, probably be overzealous and try and cram in too much information for an hour's time. but. Um, I'm here all weekend, so uh, flag me down if you have questions, uh, comments. I'd, I'd love to talk about this stuff um, as well. So, is there something different I can be doing? I mean, I'm on, I'm in the HDMI port. Check your video, uh, video settings to see if you can mirror your... Well, I don't, I don't even have anything on yeah. since I plugged in. Oh, it should be. Well, there it goes. Oh, maybe it's just... Source detected, there you go. Oh, sweet. Okay. <laughs> we were just loose. Let's tuck that under and see if that'll kind of hold that in place. This is not wanting to appear to 
give me the presentation view that I wanted um, where I can see my notes. Can you guys see this okay? Do we want to turn the lights off yeah, and maybe have it yeah. look a little better? where I was going to try and be super official and like essentially read the video script to you as we go, but it's like not even there. So I guess the father just wants me to, to wing this, so we'll just do that as well. Um, so dust of the earth, uh, wanting to look at and discuss the evidence that supports the biblical account of, of man having been created by the dust of the earth. So let's just first start off by just looking at those verses. Um, in Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Uh, Genesis 3, 23, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, uh, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That is just looking terrible up there. I apologize for that. The colors seem kind of goofy. Uh, but when we look at that word for dust, um, it's Strong 6380, which is um, a far. I'm probably butchering that. I apologize. But among the many definitions included in that is, is a really interesting word. Um, it mentions clay. And so, you know, could it be possible? Like, we certainly all have, if not a practical understanding, at least a functional understanding of the fact that certainly there's many kinds of vessels that you can make from clay, which is... You know, a simplified version of that would just be it's water and earth mixed together into a, a malleable uh, kind of structure. And so included in that is the idea of clay. Uh, and so there's actually an interesting connection. Um, you know, does scripture convey anything that would give us an understanding that, that this could possibly have been the case? Uh, so in Genesis, again, this is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the he earth and the heavens, before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So there's nothing admittedly that says that these two verses need to necessarily be connected. But it's interesting to me, at least, that right before we see the creation of man, there's a mention of this mist, you know, coming up from the surface of the ground. So there is a combination, at least, you know, theoretically, of, of water and earth being combined before the creation of man. And then interestingly enough, we have a lot of verses that complement uh, an understanding of us being made from clay. Uh, in Job, truly, I, is, I am as your spokesman before God. I have also been formed out of clay. Again, in Job 10, remember, I pray, that you have made me like clay, and will you turn me into dust again? And so these verses are fascinating to me as, as potential confirmation. Is this something that I would be dogmatic about? Certainly not, but I think it's really compelling just thinking about us literally being formed perhaps out of clay. We also have verses where this is uh, addressed uh, metaphorically, but now, O oh Lord, you are our father, we are the clay, and you our potter, and we are all the work of your hand. And then Paul in Romans 9, you know, referencing this same passage from Isaiah, says, does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor, and another for dishonor. So we certainly see a lot of, of interesting scriptures that make reference of us being formed out of clay, uh, quite literally. And that's enough for me to be sure, to stand on a belief that yes, definitively, you know, the, the first man was made from the dust of the earth. Um, but I always think it's fascinating to see what kind of scriptural, or what kind of scientific evidence supports this, because um, that's always been my belief, is that science complements the Bible. So science confirms what the Bible already identifies as truth, and when we can see that, it just strengthens our faith, uh, and, and I think makes the Bible just come alive in new and fascinating ways. So, um, first of all, just looking at the elements in 
the human body. So the human body is made of 96% of oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Which to me, right away, 96% and H2O is included in there. So to me, that's another little interesting tidbit that having water um, being such a dominant part, obviously, that adds credence to my mind, at least, of the idea of us being made from clay. Um, and then you've got trace elements, about 4% of the human body being made up, uh, comprised of these other uh, major trace elements. And then you have even a smaller faction uh, made up of, of all of these other elements as well. So from an elemental perspective, these are all the ingredients needed you know, to, to make a human, okay? So comparing that to what we find in the crust of the Earth, um, right off the bat, every single major element found in the human body is also found in the crust of the Earth. Um, and so these are, uh, again, from an uh, Answers in Genesis article, uh, and it demonstrates or it shows you here what the different amounts are. Uh, to me, again, something else that's super interesting about this is that there's varying degrees of ratios. So the present, the, the ratio or amount of of these elements found in the human body differs in some cases than the amount that's typically found in, in the crust of the earth, oftentimes to uh, different degrees. So oxygen, for example, makes up uh, 40 or about 61% of the human body and about 46% of the earth's crust, whereas uh, potassium, for example, makes up about two tenths of the human body, but about 2.6% of the earth's crust. And this seems to be distributed about evenly, with about 50% of the elements having a greater degree uh, in the human body and about 50% having a greater degree in the crust of the Earth. We'll come back to why uh, I think that's significant here in just a moment. But this is also true for even the trace elements, that we have uh, an even distribution of about 50% of the elements having a greater ratio in the human body and about 50% having a greater ratio in the crust of the earth. So, I mean, already, essentially, it's a case-closed kind of situation because, yes, all the ingredients are present in the dust of the earth to make a human. Uh, and so, to me, that's beautiful confirmation right off the bat that, that I think is just incredibly exciting. Uh, but there's also, it should be noted that, you know, these are the current levels uh, for the, the dust of the earth. Um, so certainly it's, it's uh, plausible to suggest that when God declared everything to be very good after creation week, that many of these uh, levels and ratios would have been much higher. And certainly the worldwide flood would have, would have affected dramatically the soil composition that we see right now. So what else can we glean from this information, uh, from the fact that all of the elements required for a human body are also present in the crust of the earth? I think there's three major points that we can address. The one, that we are more than just elements. Two, we are more than just physical bodies. And three, we are more than just ourselves. So I want to elect that there is these differing ratios suspends the possibility for an evolutionary understanding of that. because. Uh, again, the evolutionary understanding is that, you know, natural processes over time. So if they would want to try and, and allude to that, we would expect to see the same ratios in the human body as in the crust of the earth. The fact that there's differences and the fact that they're evenly distributed, uh, to my mind, actually points towards uh, intelligent design being involved in their creation. And here's why I believe that, because the human body, again, with all of its various systems and organs and processes and self-healing capabilities, it's an extremely sophisticated biological machine. And so to take all of these different elements and combine them in just the right amount of ratio to create this amazing, incredibly complex biological systems required for the human body to function, obviously points towards intelligence being designed in this. And we see this actually in the world right now. One of the big things that uh, the evolutionary worldview likes to do is, is examine processes now in effect. Because the idea is that we should be able to, to identify and examine things going on now to trace our understanding back in history, right? So processes now in effect that would allude to this are the fact that there are tens of thousands of man-made chemicals produced every year um, and, uh, or excuse me, tens of thousands that are now in existence with a thousand or more created every year. 
And, and with this advent of man-made chemicals, we're seeing the same thing taking place where uh, the intelligence of human designers are taking the existing elements or chemicals that are found uh, in the natural world and in the crust of the earth, and they're combining them at different and precise ratios in order to produce a myriad of different things that they'd like to have. So for example, this is the molecular structure of, uh, of composition of Teflon. You know, so it took intelligence to combine these elements to produce a specific desired intended result. We see the same thing happening uh, in the human body. And, and we marvel at our own intelligence and some of the things that we are able to create using our understanding of the elements and using our understanding of when we combine uh, different ratios and combinations of these elements with other man-made substances and things, we can create some pretty remarkable things, and we like to pat ourselves on the back for that. The point being, though, and the point that many of you understand is that when structures like these are analyzed, it's easy to recognize design. It's easy to see when something has clearly had intelligence involved in its production. Um, and so the fact that those ratios present in the, the crust of the Earth differ uh, than what's seen in the human body, to me, it just screams, again, evidence for a designer. So we are certainly more uh, than just elements. But we're also more than just physical. And we understand this going into this, that when we go back to Genesis, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Uh, I'm sure you guys have heard uh, this before, but when we understand the, the, there's the physical body, but then we were not, we did not become alive until we received that breath of life that he breathed into our nostrils. So clearly there is a, a non-tangible divine origin to our physical bodies being alive. Um, and this is easy things. And, and furthermore, it would be problematic that if we truly were just the byproduct of a random undirected process, how could we trust the conclusions that we're coming to with all of these non-tangible, unphysical attributes of, of what it means to be a human and what it means to be, uh, to be alive? And so um, the fact that we are more than just the physical bodies, again, confirmed by scripture, and this is something that uh, I'm sure most of you are well aware of, but that word for living soul, same with breath, of life is the Hebrew word nefesh, and its definitions down here it says that which breathes, the breathing substance or being, soul, or the inner being of man. And so that begs the question that you know has plagued humanity since the beginning: is what exactly is life? We still, you know, science has not been able to to identify or quantify what it actually is for something to be uh, to be alive. And so, and, and we're not going to solve that today either, but there is a passage um, in Leviticus 17 that I think sheds some interesting light um, on, on the Father's view of life um, in an indirect way, and we find that with his uh, instructions on, on how we're to handle blood. So starting at verse 3, it says, Whatever man of the house of Israel who kills an ox or a lamb or a goat in the camp or who kills it outside the camp and does not bring it to the door of the tabernacle of meeting to offer an offering to the Lord before the tabernacle of the Lord, the guilt of bloodshed shall be imputed to that man. He has shed blood, and that man shall be cut off from among his people. I mean, to me, again, I think one of the underpinning themes of this idea is that the Father expects of us to have a sanctity of life. Like, even of animal life, there is a, there is a respect that is commanded for the taking of a life, for the shedding of blood. Um, and this becomes something that is uh, obviously connected to the, the death of Yeshua on our behalf. Uh, going on in Leviticus at verse 10, it says, And whatever man of the house of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you who eats any blood, I will set my face against that person who eats blood, and I will cut him off from among his people. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. And again, to me, obviously, when we read this, I mean, it just sounds like Yeshua. It's, again, it's one of the many examples in Old Testament where we're seeing prophecy of it. Um, so the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when we're speaking of atonement, blood has to be shed so that the life that was in the blood that was shed is what atones for the life that is in your blood. 
And so there's this picture of a life for a life, and that transpiring through the, the shedding of, of blood. And again, the word souls here is, again, uh, it's the same word, nefesh, that we see for the breath of life. So there's this intricate connection between the spirit and the body and the blood and what truly makes us alive. Finishing up there in Leviticus 17, it says, Whatever man of the children of Israel or of the strangers who dwell among you, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For the life, or, or it is the life of all flesh. Its blood sustains its life. Therefore, I said to the children of Israel, you shall not eat the blood of any flesh. For the life of all flesh is in its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. So again, you know, we see this repeated multiple times. Again, I think this is a great picture of him being a good father, because any good parent repeats the things that are important, so we make sure to not miss it, right? But I also think it was super interesting that that when you've killed something that can be eaten, that its blood is covered with dust. So again, it's a picture of it returning to the dust from which it came. I thought that was a really fascinating little connection. Um, but again, so the life of the flesh is in its blood. Its blood sustains its life. So this still doesn't really identify what is life, but there's that connection to the life being in the blood that I think is very interesting. Um, there was an article published by Dr. Elizabeth Mitchell uh, on the Answers in Genesis website that I think does a nice job of, of summarizing this connection uh, to blood and life. It says, the Bible never actually defines life, but neither does science. We all know that an organism can go from being alive one moment to dead the next. Science and common human experience can describe the characteristics of life, but we've never discovered that intangible quality that makes something alive. Uh, she goes on to say that life is a gift from God. Blood sustains life, but blood is not life. Creatures are able to continue living because they have blood, but the blood does not make them alive. Their blood keeps them alive. But if they die from something besides bleeding to death, they are dead even though there is still blood in their bodies. Thus, the presence of blood in the embryo beyond a certain size is necessary to sustain its life, the life it already possesses as a gift from God. And in the case of a human embryo, that gift includes being made in the very image of God. So even though we come from the dust, there is this intangible quality that connects us intricately to the Creator uh, because we have His very breath in us as, as a gift we obviously didn't deserve. We are also more than just ourselves. If we look back at Genesis 1, 28, it said, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Again, this might be a stretch, but I think this is, again, an interesting connection that the command to be fruitful and multiply at least references our understanding of the complexity of the genetic information that was pre-programmed uh, into humans at creation. Uh, because again, it's just recycling of those elements from the dust of the earth uh, to combine into us. And we have to remember that since DNA contains literally its coded information, we have to remember that the laws of information science apply to this. And information only ever originates from an intelligent source, not from a natural, pro a natural process. In his book, Dr. Uh, Stephen Meyer um, uh, Darwin Design and Public Education has this to say, the information contained in an English sentence or a computer software does not derive from the chemistry of the ink or the physics of magnetism, but from a source extrinsic to physics and chemistry altogether. Indeed, in both cases, the message transcends the properties of the medium. The information in DNA also transcends the properties of its material medium. That information had to come from a source uh, different than the, the materials that it's made from. And so uh, that's super important to remember with DNA. Even Bill Gates, who is admittedly an evolutionary world uh, view supporter, had this to say in his books, The Road Ahead. Human DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any we've ever created. I think it's fascinating that an evolutionary advocate, when trying to convey the complexity of the DNA molecule, could come up with no other fitting metaphor than comparing it to something that we all recognize as being intelligently designed. Um, and in fact, to kind of put that in perspective even, 
uh, that can, because of what is responsible, what DNA does in the human body, if we, if we wanted to apply that to Gates' metaphor, to truly put it in perspective, that would be like a computer program that originated its own unique, unique language, wrote its own code, designed its own physical components, and created the physical matter with which to form those components, all from nothing. And so again, it's, it's a remarkable leap of faith to suggest that these things could happen from an undirected process, but it's a beautiful confirmation of the, of the intelligence of our uh, father. So one of the other things that I wanted to address as an interesting connected side topic is that of uh, decomposition. Uh, because we also see this as being something that is both identified in the Bible, that we see playing out in the real world, and again, is, is a beautiful example of the Bible being true. And it's something that quite honestly, when you stop to think about it, is really kind of bizarre that every living thing, when it dies, turns into dirt. Like, why would that even happen, you know? So, um, and so that, to me, is super compelling evidence. And we see this, again, uh, being connected right off the bat as part of the original curse. Uh, in Genesis 3, 18 through 19, Cursed is the ground for your sake, and toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. So we see the Father himself essentially mandating that decomposition is going to be a part of our existence. In Ecclesiastes, uh, we also see, for what happens to the sons of men also happens to animals. One thing befalls them all. As one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals, for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and all return to the dust. It's interesting that this connection uh, applies to both uh, man and animals as well. We also see in Job, um, speaking about the Father's restraining power, his presence and control over all life, if he should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Again, one other set of verses here that even complements our understanding with this being applicable to the animals. Uh, in Psalm 104, you hide your face, and he's speaking about the animals. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die, and return to their dust. Well, I also found this verse, which I think is a, another interesting aside as far as what happens to the souls of animals. I know that's a, a common topic for people about, you know, will, will our pets be in heaven? Um, <coughs> But Ecclesiastes seems to sum that up, saying, Who knows the spirit of the sons of men which goes upward, and the spirit of the animal which goes down to the earth. So again, this return of the soul to the earth. I just realized, too, I, I do have this short video in here. I don't know if the audio is going to go, so we'll, we'll give this a try. It's just a short little claymation video um, that uh, addresses what actually happens. When a person's heart happened. stops beating the body passes through several stages before it begins decomposing. Within minutes after death, the blood begins settling in the lowermost parts of the body. Usually 8 to 12 hours later, the skin in those areas is discolored by liver mortis, or post-mortem stain. And while at the moment of death, the body's muscles relax completely in a condition called primary flaccidity, they stiffen about 2 to 6 hours later in what's known as rigor mortis. This stiffening spreads through the muscles, and its speed can be affected by age, gender, and the surrounding environment. The body also changes temperature, usually cooling off to match its environment. Next comes decomposition, the process by which bacteria and insects break apart the body. Many factors affect the rate of decomposition. There is, however, a basic guide of the effect of the environment on decomposition called Casper's Law. It says that if all other factors are equal, a body exposed to air decomposes twice as fast as one immersed in water, and eight times as fast as one buried in earth. Soil acidity also greatly affects bone preservation. High acidity soils with a pH of less than 5.3 will rapidly decompose bone. 
whereas in a neutral or basic soil with a pH of 7 or more, a skeleton can remain in relatively good condition for centuries. So, without wanting to get too gross, I do want to briefly address uh, decomposition as a scientific process, as a biological function that we see playing out in the world. And scientists have identified uh, five major stages of the decomposition process. And you can read up on it, and it's terrifically gross. But uh, I'm not going to regale you with all the details. Suffice to say that, surprisingly, it's a very orderly process, a very orderly and predictable process, like every natural process that we see uh, in the world. Uh, and again, this presents a challenge to a Darwinian understanding in explaining how and why this process would have developed according to a traditionally evolutionary perspective. Because again, natural selection as it is proposed by uh, classic Darwinian evolution is of course survival of the fittest. So once an animal dies, clearly there's no more advantageous situations for it to, to further develop new processes, right? So that means that the whole idea of decomposition would have had to have been present in the, in the DNA before the animal was alive, which is just adding to the to-do list for that first cell. Um, and so it's a remarkable thing when you start thinking about it. Um, and in fact, what's even more fascinating, though, is that their death, while it's clearly no longer advantageous for that particular organism, does provide opportunities for other organisms because decomposition is regulated both by um, insects and, and larvae externally from the, the body that has died and internally. So, uh, you know, the body is consumed both from the outside in and the inside out. And this also, this fact also, the fact that it involves the interaction of several special, specialized species further adds to the complication that uh, from an evolutionary perspective because then all of these organisms that are uh, part of the decomposition process would have had to have been developing this ability simultaneously as they you know, evolved from a lower order. And they would have had to evolve the ability to either you know, reproduce, develop, and thrive inside other living organisms so that once they die, then they can benefit from the death by, by consuming the dead tissue or develop the ability to recognize dead bodies in order that they could quickly deposit rapidly developing eggs. So again, the, as with anything, the more you really look into it, the more problematic it becomes to understand it from an evolutionary perspective. But of course, for a, a biblical worldview, this is perfectly in line with what we understand from creation week. Uh, because we see on day six, then God said, let the earth bring forth, again, coming from the earth, the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast according to it, its kind, each with its own kind, and it was so. Now evolutionists will often laugh at this suggestion that our, essentially our answer is, well, that's what the Bible says. But you know what? Ours is a story that has never had to change, whereas the evolutionary understanding of the world is constantly revised over and over and over. And while they might be repulsive to some people, we've got to appreciate that these creatures are a remarkable production of engineering and design and structure and order. And we constantly are developing new and new technologies trying to duplicate what is present in the natural world. And so these really are amazing creatures, and in and of themselves, the gross little creeping things that are part of decomposition are a testament to the provision and wisdom of our creator. So moving on, uh, life from the earth. Obviously, humans no longer come from the earth, but it's fascinating that we do still see life in one degree uh, originating from the earth. Uh, in the form of plants. And there's certainly an interesting debate about the difference between plants and, uh, and animals and humans and whether plants are truly alive or not because the Bible talks about them withering. Um, but that's, that's a debate for another time. But I do want to address an interesting connection between that. And God said in Genesis 1, again, let the earth bring forth, whoops, excuse me, I forgot to myself. Apologies, there we are. 
uh, let the earth bring forth uh, grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth, and it was so. So right off the bat, uh, right from the start of creation week, there is a connection between humans and plants and how we see uh, the Lord God planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man who he had formed. We also see this in Genesis 3. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden to till the ground from which he was taken. So right away there's an intricate connection, an intricate relationship between humans and plants. Uh, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden uh, of Eden to tend it and to keep it. We also see in Genesis 1, and the Lord God said, See, I have given you every herb that it yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. So there is a fascinating and a continuing uh, symbiotic relationship between humans and between plants, both in the fact that they uh, we have this mutually beneficial uh, relationship between uh, the gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. And again, a lot of these things, it's so easy for us to take for granted that, yeah, they, you know, we exhale carbon dioxide, they exhale oxygen, it's great. Um, symbiotic relationships are remarkably complex situations because, again, from the evolutionary perspective, those systems have to be developing at the same time. And that would seem to imply purpose. And an undirected process devoid of meaning isn't going to have purpose, right? And there's inherently purpose in the fact that we sustain plants and plants sustain us. And so again, this makes perfect sense with what we see uh, scripture teaching. And so while humans obviously no longer come from the earth, we can certainly make the case that our life is sustained by the plants that do come from the earth. And then, of course, we return to the earth um, as well. So I think that's a point that needs to be made. And this is the same relationship that we eventually see in the new heaven and new earth with the tree of life. Revelation says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life, which bore twelve fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So even on into eternity, this symbiotic relationship between plants and uh, humans uh, continues to be part of our Father's design. So again, obviously all of this is laughable to, to much of the mainstream scientific community. But I want to address what I think is, is really an important understanding to uh, to have. Um, and, and again, I had an article I was going to read, but my note sheets isn't here. But uh, without wanting to put words in their mouth, it summarized their belief of what happened. And uh, there's a little animation here to go that essentially, you know, their understanding of the Big Bang that, you know, you have the initial explosion of the Big Bang and, and it producing all of these different nebula and gases and of course through gravitational forces and the expansion of energy that these things were uh, contracted together um, into one place and then it's supposed to start spinning and forming this giant spinning disk of gas and energy and of course they themselves admit, I mean no one ever observed this but we're just pretty sure that this is, this is how it happened. Um, and then that began to explode again and and uh, produced all of these particles that then began to collide together through gravitational forces, became tiny seeds of planets, which then uh, collided and further grew. And so over billions of years, you've got, you've got the development of planets, and then of course, you've got to somehow introduce water into this situation. But so this is their understanding, obviously, and we've all heard this because we're, I mean, we're completely indoctrinated with this understanding of the world pretty much from every form of media. Uh, but here's why I want to dwell on this for just a minute. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Krauss, probably one of the most well-known um, theoretical physicists, he's a, a, a college professor uh, and um, an author and is the go-to guy when any news media source wants to talk about anything in physics. He's written a book whose title is literally A Universe from Nothing, Why There is Some. This is far different from the false picture obtained by those who choose to ignore empirical data to invent a picture of reality, young earthers, for example, 
or those who instead require the existence of something for which there is no observable evidence whatsoever, like divine intelligence, to recognize their view of creation with their a priori prejudices, or worse still, those who cling to fairy tales about nature that presume the answers before questions can ever even be asked. He goes on to say in the book that the universe, the way it is, whether we like it or not, the existence or non-existence of a creator is independent of our desires. A world without God or purpose may seem harsh or pointless, but that alone doesn't require God to actually exist. And uh, a later passage, this is probably one of his most uh, well-known quotes, you can find clips of this online too. The amazing thing is that every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. And the atoms in your left hand probably came from a different star than that in your right hand. It really is the most poetic thing I know about physics. You are all stardust. You couldn't be here if stars hadn't exploded because the elements, the carbon, the nitrogen, oxygen, iron, all the things that matter for evolution weren't created at the beginning of time. They were created in the nuclear furnaces of stars. And the only way they could get into your body is if those stars were kind enough to explode. So forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. This is a remarkable quote. And what's so ironic about it is that while he is blatantly, uh, blatantly chastising the sacrifice of our Savior, he's also unknowingly and indirectly affirming the biblical account of creation. Because did you catch what he said? You are all dust. The mainstream scientific community can't refute the fact that all of the elemental ingredients necessary for the human body are found in the dust of the earth. But we can't acknowledge that because that goes against the evolutionary narrative. And so they have to come up with this storyline that has no supportable evidence to prove that it's starved because it can't be from God. And it's ironic because he's chastising us for believing in fairy tales about nature that have no observable evidence. When at the onset of their own explanation for how it all began, they'll openly admit there's no observable evidence to support this, but trust us. This is how it went down. So to me, that's fascinating. Um, and I, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, I'm gonna breeze through a few of these again. So I want to return to that because, again, this is the evidence that they can't support. All of the, all of the elements in the probability are applied to the known facts of biology. Uh, another quote, and I'm going to, honestly, i got five minutes. I'm going to skip through this. But this is uh, an example. You can, um, uh, this is in the video that you can find on the uh, YouTube channel. Um, but Dr. Stephen Meyer again outlines uh, a specific example, and this goes into some detail about uh, a study done by um, Dr. researcher Dr. Douglas Axe, who was looking into the probability of just one particular protein, and the way proteins are formed um, is that there's instructions encoded in the DNA molecule. The proteins are essentially folded. So think about like microscopic biological origami, essentially. And the, the punchline here is that this 150-folded protein is one of the smaller ones. Most of them have folds up into the thousands. And so in his research, um, he compared it, the, the probability of, of this one protein being able to be formed through random chance, uh, and he was comparing it to the likelihood of you being able to identify one single marked atom out of all of the atoms in the universe. And the order of magnitude was that you have a greater, you have one chance in a trillion, 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 trillion times smaller to find that single marked atom than you could for natural process to, re to result in the DNA order uh, that forms the instructions to fold this protein. Essentially what it's saying is again, when we study, truly study what's going on on a molecular level, it's game over because the complexity is just beyond um, uh, imaginable. And what this means is that scientific evidence ultimately supports the Bible and we can be confident in that resolution. Um, but it is the same game going on as it was in the Garden of Eden. This is spiritual warfare at its best. And we can recognize this because it's the same argument the enemy has always ever been doing. 
is this is it really true that God said? <clears throat> Satan's main strategy is to get you to question the word of God. And so the mainstream media is working overtime, providing you with examples in literally every form of educational and entertainment media, supporting the idea that evolution is true and to believe otherwise makes you unintelligent and uneducated. What he's doing is he's trying to get you to question, did God really say? And so once we are aware of that, we realize that we're presented with the same choice. And the choice is yours to make. You can believe that nothing formed all matter, space, and time through unguided natural processes that were devoid of purpose. This random sequence of events which supposedly gave rise to all the laws of physics actually broke most of those laws in the process. After billions of years of time and zillions of astro astronomically improbable coincidences, the world as we know it, with all of its beauty, order, and appearance of design, was created so that you could be born into a meaningless life and die for no reason. That's essentially the evolutionary worldview. Or you could believe that an infinite creator formed all matter, space, and time with a distinct purpose through his boundless wisdom and power. The obviousness of his creation is evident in the many consistent and predictable... Oh, excuse me. I clicked one too many times. I apologize. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the obviousness of his creation is evident in the many consistent and predictable natural laws. The order, structure, and complexity of life has... <laughs> I guess we're moving on. <laughs> We've all obviously made the choice already, and so I know I'm preaching to the choir. But this is, again, what the world is especially pumping into the minds of our kids. Like this cartoon and much of the mainstream world is trying to say that most of the world are choosing answers that are simple but wrong or complex but right. And to me, again, they're using the same argument that Yeshua used, but it's just flipped on its head, right? Because Yeshua said that enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. <clears throat> so summing up here, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, Paul is addressing, again, this connection of the spiritual man and the man of dust. He says, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are those who are made of dust. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have been born the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And of course, that's all our blessed hope, is that one day he's going to return and make us into his own image in, a, in an actual, tangible, physical way. So what should this do to your everyday walking around faith life? I think it should be another example of the Father craves humility because knowledge of having been made from dust should keep us humble before him. Uh, in Jeremiah 18, he says, Look, as, is the, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so also you are in my hand. And just like clay must be put into the fire to be strengthened, we too must be put through struggles in order to be strong enough to serve our intended purpose. Beloved, do not be surprised, Peter says, at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's, Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. He goes on to say, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So we must remember these last few verses in, in closing. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So I apologize for a few technical glitches there. Uh, but thanks so much, honestly, for coming and listening. Uh, you can find more of this on YouTube, and I'll be around out in the main lobby all week. So thanks so much.